Okay, super. Um, oh, I can't, you put me on spotlight. How annoying. I want to see all your faces. That's better. Don't want to just see my face for the next 20 minutes. Um, so yeah, hello. Thank you all for coming. Um, getting a little bit more used to these kind of online events now. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a funny old world where we can't meet in person, uh, where you can't, uh, you know, read the room as it were. Um, so I'm going to do my best um, to see if I'm boring you. Uh, but I'm going to speak, I think, for about 20 minutes. And um, what I'm going to try to do is talk about some problems that there are and the, what I think are some of the root causes of these problems um, in our rights and how we can use a rights model to win these campaigns in the end uh, with organising at its heart and I think these are very green party ways to look at these problems um, and if you want to know about like the more of the numbers and the problems that I might give you a test later you must read Ty's article in Bright Green uh, which I'm sure a lot of you did before you came here but it's really good at, at sort of laying out the, the big fat numbers that there are and that are some of the problems. I will also have a very big fat number for you later on and get ready to type your guesses into the charts about what that will be. Um, um, so yeah, I'll start, um, and I'll start by introducing myself because um, I'm uh, I'm a private renter. That is my current housing tenure, and has been ever since um, I moved. Uh, to London ever since I was a student before that as well, um, over 20 years ago, um, and I'm here in my flat, um, which is a studio flat in the London Borough of Camden. It's in zone two. I'm near the tube station. This is all good stuff. This flat costs me currently exactly one third of my take home pay after all the deductions that there are from my pay um, and I am paid more than double the average wage now as a London Assembly member. When I first moved into this flat I was working for a charity and I was earning basically exactly the average wage and at that time this flat cost me more than half my take home pay so I can afford my flat now but I couldn't afford my flat then not really I was making up for the difference in all kinds of ways so I'm pretty passionate about this issue and I've been wondering you know what's wrong with the system why is it so stacked against us looking at these problems ever since I was elected to the London Assembly and before that and my other job, which Ty didn't mention, is that I'm also a local councillor. And I know from being a local councillor just how many of the problems that come to me as casework are related to housing injustice and the unfairness that's built into the system that, that automatically excludes lots of people. So I'm, this is one of the issues I most like to talk about. And I'm going to try and try not to do my full hour of ranting. And I'm going to try and focus it in on some things. And I'm going to focus, first of all, on rights and the goals of policy because if you're going to set out your goals for a housing policy as the government why would you not make that goal to guarantee against any homelessness to guarantee people's um human right to a roof over their heads and it just isn't in policy we had um i'm standing for mayor of london currently and someone else who's standing for mayor of london is rory stewart and and halfway through the the campaign which is now pause now um he announced he wanted to halve street homelessness in london <laughs> and most of twitter piped up and said are you sure that's the right target should the target not be to eliminate homelessness <laughs> in london and that i think just absolutely is a dead giveaway as to the mindset of the establishment on this. Um, so I wanted to go back now to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, because we do have a human right to housing. It's written right there, it's in Article 25, go and look it up. Um, it says, everyone has the right to a standard of living adequate for the health and well-being of himself and his family, including food, clothing, housing, medical care, necessary social services, and the right to security in the event of unemployment, sickness, disability, widowhood, old age, or other lack of livelihood in circumstances beyond his control. So does any of that sound quite familiar from the current crisis? Yeah, when it came to a crisis, we started to guarantee people these human rights because we realised as a society that it wasn't just that they didn't have them. But in normal times, do we have that right written into our laws? Is this right something that the policy of the government does? Well, no, not so much. The UK Human Rights Act, which is based on the European Convention of Human Rights, 
somehow manages to leave out the human rights that are um, set out in Article 20. Five. Um, they they keep the right that is the right to um, private enjoyment of your property, but they do not include the right to basic material security, and that is a genuine real problem. Um, you know, there's a problem somewhere in the EU. We need to have more green MPs changing the European Convention of Human Rights to bring that one in. Um, and within the current government, I mean, the, the UK Human Rights Act was brought in by the Labour government. They could have added an extra right to it and gone, hang on, there's one missing it. They didn't. They didn't do that. They just brought across the ones from the European Convention. And then our own Equality Act, which is the other place where we have some rights enshrined and, and things that we, we are entitled to, um, it has a section in section one of the um, Equality Act, um, which says, let me just get, let me just find it out. Um, what have I done with it? Um, it says that um, when you're making strategic um, legislation, you absolutely have to have due regard to the desirability of exercising them in a way that is designed to reduce the inequalities of outcome which result from socio-economic disadvantage. That's a lovely section. Um, the only problem is, it's written into the Equality Act uh, 2010 and it's never been commenced. So somehow the Secretaries of State, and this is again 2010, this is um, you know the, 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 the government that wrote it was Labour, the, the Cameron government brought it in, they did not commence that article, uh, that section of the Equality Act. So that is the only socio-economic right, and it's a collective right for, for everybody that everybody can um, exercise that would be acting on our policies now to guarantee us the right to, to decent housing. But it doesn't, it's not enacted. Scotland enacted it um, in 2018, and I think quite possibly that lays, lies behind some of the ways that the Greens within Scotland have managed to get policies like free buses and things brought in because um, they, they have that peg within law to put it on. So there you go. We, we have our, our human rights legislation is fundamentally flawed um, and allows the government, therefore, to bring in all those kinds of laws that we're familiar with that, that design into the system gaps for people to fall through, that allow the deprivation of you from having a home to be taken away as, as, like, a, as like a punishment. Um, it's things like um, setting local housing allowance rates at rates that don't cover the rent shouldn't be allowed if you had a decent rights framework within law. Things like council allocation schemes, like I'm a council councillor and I spend a lot of time knowing the insides of the council's um, allocation scheme, which is how people get the right to have a council home um, allocated to them. And council allocation schemes are incredibly restrictive and they're very sort of variable as well. The councils all write their own. So within Camden, you need to have been attached to Camden, um, living in Camden or, or with a proper attachment there um, for five of the last seven years. And if you go away for a bit and come back, you lose your local connection is what it's called. Other councils um, don't take away that right um, and they let you claim, but then those councils have really, really long waiting lists. Um, other councils have different rules that are, that are much more restrictive than, than, than Camden's e even. Um, and I think Westminster is one of the ones, and Tyrone might know this, uh, Westminster is one of the ones with the worst. Um, so those, those council allocation schemes, you can see that somebody who moves, as we all do in London, from borough to borough to borough, can end up with no council officially owing them a duty of putting them into a home. So that just automatically excludes people. You have um, EU citizens who have difficulty claiming if they're not um, working. I've dealt with casework on that. Um, and you've also got things like the, the right to rent, so that you've got government bringing in policies that it knows are going to necessarily exclude people and deny them the right to rent a home. Um, and that's just been found to have, uh, that was went to courts, and it's just been found to have discriminatory um, results to be found to be um, against the Equalities Act, but they didn't find it to be completely un unlawful. And that's, that's really interesting too. But you can see that you can think of lots of different policies, bedroom tax, loads of things that, that are um, not doing that thing, which is guaranteeing you um, the right to, to 
um, have a roof over your head. Um, and the, the government can just write those because there's no way of challenging them with, within the current laws. Um, so yeah, as Tyrone said, there's lots and lots of people on the streets, there's loads of people um, like under um, in temporary accommodation, um, there's lots of people who are officially homeless. And one of the, some of the work I've been doing in City Hall is looking at hidden homelessness because actually what I know is these gaps, people don't all fall straight from being evicted from a, from a private rented home like this onto the street. Most people have people around them who will try to pick up the pieces. So I've done work on hidden homelessness, which is people who end up sofa surfing, staying with other people, families, living with other families, because they just have no other place to turn because the council's turning them down because they can't get access to housing in other ways. And during the research that we did as part of the housing committee on the assembly, we worked out that on any given night, about 13 times more people were hidden homeless in the kinds of ways I've described than were actually on the streets and street homeless. And that's really, really huge. Um, and I wanted to do more research on this. So what we did, we tried to, because that's so many people, we thought we could back this up by checking um, and cross-referencing with opinion research. So we actually asked Londoners, um, have you ever um, put anybody up who was otherwise going to be homeless? Um, and, and we asked them also, I'm just going to go back to one. Oh, no, I need to go. Hang on, sorry. I need to go look at my screen. And we also asked them, um, have you done this in the last year? And have you done this? Um, are you doing this currently? And what we found is that one in 10 Londoners have actually done this. They have looked after somebody in need in the past year. So that's Londoners themselves, the friends and family of the people who are becoming homeless. And that could be, quite honestly, any of us, if, if something goes wrong in our lives, we're the ones picking up the pieces and, and looking after them and giving them a roof over their heads. And those people don't have, we know in London, people don't have a lot of space anyway, they don't have spare bedrooms. So this is people then living in overcrowded conditions which we don't measure properly either but the most shocking thing was when we looked at the numbers who were currently have someone staying with them three percent of Londoners said they do and if you multiply that up by how many people there are in London how many households there are in London you get 110,000 households who are actually looking after somebody at the current time um, and and I've lost lost my zoom I can't go back to zoom that's interesting <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I can't see you anymore, um, but I'll carry on talking um, on the assumption that you're still there. Um, hang on a moment. There you are. You are still there. Oh my goodness, I thought I'd cut myself off. Um, and 110,000 is almost exactly double the number of people who are recognised as homeless and being kept in temporary accommodation by councils. So the, the people of London are picking up the pieces to, the, to double the extent that councils are. And that is really shocking. And it's a direct result of all those people falling through the gaps that are deliberately designed into the system. And I think that's really, really wrong. So there's the right to just not be homeless, but there's also um, rights not to, not to have inequality massively um, exacerbated. And the government really, really does this as well. It has an absolute focus and it has, I mean, every government going right back to the introduction of right to buy by Thatcher, but you know, the Blair government never got rid of right to buy either. Um, they've always, always, and, and the, we see the Labour councils now doing the same thing, focusing on market homes uh, when they're building new homes um, and replacing the estates that we're talking about absolute focus of, on homes as assets, trying to push people into home ownership as the goal of policy, instead of the goal of policy being to prevent people um, from becoming homeless, to guarantee people the right um, to, to rent affordably. Um, and there's a massive focus on the rights of the asset holders and the landlords. And this falls directly from the fact that within the human rights framework, we haven't got the right to um, material security, but you do have the right to your property. So the property owners actually have human rights that the renters do not. And that is really, really um, fundamental. But the inequalities also extend to within homeowners as well. We know that leaseholders, particularly the ones on estates that are being redeveloped, their rights are not very well respected either because they're leaseholders under a, a landlord, a, a, a free, freeholder. Um, and they can also end up in, in, in often in the worst position of all when estates are redeveloped because tenants have um, a secure tenancy. They have the right to be rehoused. Those leaseholders have no right to be given 
compensation for the loss of the homes that they bought in good faith thinking they were doing the right thing um, they often end up just not able to to replace the home that they lose um, and that's incredibly wrong um, so both these attitudes the focus on homes as assets the focus on um, sort of increasing inequality they both design into the system more inequality and I think that's kind of outrageous so you've got this kind of you, you if you haven't got any wealth then you're building up you're trying to build up your wealth you have no rights to, to to material security or fulfillment as a person and all those things that are written into the green party's philosophical basis alongside the human rights that i've mentioned earlier um, you have no right to to get to that point until you actually have what amounts to wealth at which point the government will protect that to the hilt it will absolutely throw itself under a bus to protect your wealth but it won't protect your right to to just build up security and the ability to to relax and, and enjoy your life in a fulfilled way i think that's that's really really wrong and it is genuinely a choice the government um could be making so moving on um we've got the housing crisis that we've talked about things have been getting worse rents have been getting more and more and more expensive so now I want to give you a quiz and can I look at the chat? I think I can. So we've been looking at um, the amount that rents have been going up um, in London, but also in other cities as well. But these are my, these are my London numbers because I've worked them out in more detail. And um, oh, I'm good. good. This is good. Just doing <laughs> Is that, is that okay? Um, and what we've been looking at is comparing the amount that rents have gone up with inflation. And if you think about landlords, landlords do face you know, costs. Um, they need to maintain your homes. They, the rent helps to, to do that. It shouldn't need to do much more than that because they've got an asset that's appreciating as well. Um, but you can imagine that rents going up by inflation might be, a, might be a reasonable baseline. So you take rents going up by inflation as a baseline and you look at what's actually happened to rents. And we've done these sums going back from 2018 to 2011. So in those years, which is nine years in total inclusive, um, how much too much rent do you think Londoners have paid? And the first question is how many digits do you think it has how much how much how many digits are there in the total rent that londoners have paid our landlords above inflation not even the total increase in rent since 2011 the amount we've paid them above inflation how much do you think that is right i'm going to see if i can look at the chat and see what the guesses are six digits so you think london all all, all two and a half million london renters um, have paid something like a hundred thousand pounds too much. No, it's a lot more than that. I'm telling you <laughs> 10 digits is much closer, much closer to the real answer and 12 is too much. So the answer is 11. There are 11, this is tens of billions. It's 12 billion pounds too much rent. We have paid to our landlords in London since 2011 and 2011 is more or less when I moved into this flat here. So that is a lot of money that landlords have taken from us. And remember those, those homes that they own have also gained in price as well. So they're making profits in two ways. And I think that really puts into perspective some of the asks we're making now during the coronavirus crisis of forgiving the rents that we're building up as arrears um, as renters who've maybe lost our jobs and um, been unable to pay our rent during the period. We've had uh, a three month ban on evictions that's due to come to an end. And at the end of that three month ban, according to the cur current government policy, those rent arrears become debt. But in the context of landlords having in their pockets 12 billion pounds from us on top of what would be a perfectly reasonable inflationary increase, I think our call has to be for those rents to be forgiven and for landlords who actually do find themselves in need to be the ones who the onus is on to claim back from the government. So I said that this week and it's been reported in some of the papers and I wrote about it in The Independent. And I'm hoping that, that people will be able to magnify that call because there's no way we should be paying back rents that we couldn't afford during this period. And we are going to have as a society to make some decisions about who gets to, who, who pays back 
the coronavirus crisis and who gets to claim back from the government and it shouldn't be left to renters who may be struggling in other ways to claim back that again will create gaps that people will fall through and so it needs to be sorted out but i think there's been I mean, the fact that we've even got the um, the ban on evictions for this for this period and the fact that um, landlords have been told they can't evict is actually progress. And we've been making some progress um, in getting some of our rights back. And so and I'm going to talk about three, three dominoes um, that, have, that have been knocked down one by one. And the reason that I call them dominoes is because each one then needs to lead to the next one. So the first domino that we won um, was the right to um, a home that's fit to live in. And that was the Homes Fit for Human Habitation Bill, which came in in March 2019. I believe that became the law. And what that means is you have the right to a home. This is ridiculous that you didn't have that right in the first place. You have now have the right to get your home repaired by your landlord. And you have the right to take action against your landlord um, as, a, as an individual without having to beg the council's um, environmental health people to come around and fix it. So you have your own right to sue to get your council, get your landlord to fix your home. Which is amazing, but we all know that landlords can't really be trusted. Sorry if any landlords are in the audience, pipe up later. Um, but with, with that right on its own, you, don't, you can't really enact that right because if you decide to sue your landlord to, to mend your boiler or whatever it is, um, they have the right, they, they currently have the ability to evict you for no reason um, without giving a reason. So you're absolutely laid right open to being evicted under what's called 20, section 21 of the housing act if you enact this right to a decent home that's fit for human habitation so the right to, to the, the right to not be evicted for no reason in retaliation for this has to go into law as well and that's why the government has said they will get rid of section 21 of the housing act and re remove the um the no fault evictions clause and that is another massive domino a big victory now they haven't actually brought this in yet and they said they would um and they really really need to they did a consultation on it but um but this is something they've agreed to do it's not like it's um up for consultation they, they will they have said they will do it and that's a big big victory um and then given that what we talked about with um rents going up we absolutely need rent controls um, and this has been something i've absolutely fought for as a london assembly member for a very long time and i'm going to claim huge amount of credit for this i have to say <laughs> because the, the current mayor came in in 2016 and for two and a half years right up until the very end of 2018 he did nothing about it and in fact in a number of mayor's question time sessions when I was saying to him, when are you going to do work on rent controls? He actually turned around to me and said, Sean, look, we're not going to get rent controls off the government. This government is not going to give us rent controls. There's no point in going on about it, essentially. <laughs> and um, so in 2018, in December 2018, I was in Mayor's Question Time and getting really, really cheesed off. And so what we did ahead of that was we did some polling with YouGov. Well, I, like, I like doing polling with YouGov because I like to know what people think and find out for sure whether what I think is correct. And we did the polling for, from YouGov and it showed that rent controls were very, very popular. Like two thirds of people were in favour of rent controls across the population. And interestingly, it was even more popular amongst older people than younger people, um, which actually makes me a bit sad because I think it's because younger people don't think it's possible that they're not in favour of it. And I think older people do remember when there were such things as rent controls. And so they know it's possible. And so they're more likely to say yes. I think that possibly might be it. Um, but yeah, majority of people, but by a long way in favour of rent controls. So I said this to the mayor, I said, it's popular and you should be getting on with it because you did sort of say you would and he fell into a massive trap and he said um i don't just do policies because they're popular that doesn't sound much like Sadiq Khan to me um but then he also said um you know we're not going to get rent control Sean stop going on at me about it effectively and I was able at that point to point out that the first time I had that conversation with him um in 2016 shortly after we were elected he said the same thing we're not going to get rent controls there's no point in going on about it but he also said we're not going to get a ban on tenant fees and there's no point in going on about that either and i was able in 2018 to say to the mayor actually look you said to me we would never get tenant fees and look we've won this um and so now i'm asking you to do the same thing with rent controls due to the government what i'm doing to you and campaign for it because it is popular the majority of people want it and, and it took him about a three weeks 
to change his mind after I said that. So I think that was a pretty good decisive political moment. He felt the heat and he changed his mind. And he has since commissioned work on this. He's got enough to do some excellent work on the options and actually come up with a model for renting, uh, for bringing in rent controls. And he put that into his manifesto for the current election and was going to call that his mandate to do it. Now, I would argue he had a mandate in 2016, um, and we all did, um, but he was going to start working on it after this current election if he was re-elected. Um, and you could have had it four years ago if you'd voted for me in 2016, and you'd definitely had it if I was elected in 2020. So that's progress. If we, we will, in the end, I believe now, get rent controls along, along the lines of the model that the mayor has done. He needs to do more campaigning and he needs to campaign with the other mayors from other cities. And that data I've got on the overpaid rent, I have that for Manchester and I have it for Bristol as well. And we can all gang up together when we've got green mayors in all three of those cities, we can all work together on the government um, and we can all if we don't get green mayors, we can all work on our respective mayors and get them to do that. And I th I'm confident we'll get that. But the question is then, what next? Because it's all very well getting these dom three dominoes sorted out, but actually there's a lot more wrong with the housing market than that. Um, and if we get rent controls, things that might happen include might include landlords declining in number. What will happen to those homes? Do we want the councils to buy them up? Do we want a massive state-run system of housing where all housing is provided by the state housing department? Or do we some something a little bit more green in terms of how we organize things and that's where like another right comes in and this this right is i tried to find a good bit of the the green party's um core values and philosophical basis that would get across this next right to the right to have control at the right level over your homes and it's just absolutely riddled with it. it's all the way through there is you know it's just like the whole i've been highlighting a bit um but basically all the way through the philosophical basis of the green party you've got this right for people to have control over the things that affect their daily lives at the right level and i think that's the big difference between the greens and labor when it comes to housing we're not paternalistic oh we've given you a home you should be happy um you know but please please be pleased that you, you're not on the streets at least you know we will now tell you how to run your homes and, and ban you from hanging up your washing and all of those kinds of things that treat council tenants a little bit like children i think the big difference between us and labor is we want people to have that level of personal fulfillment and control over their homes in in democratic collective ways and there's an absolute massive ecology of different ways of doing that there is council homes and and council homes run through a good system of tenants and residents associations is a very nice democratic accountable way to run public housing um, lots of councils even labor councils too are, are whittling away at the powers of tenants and residents associations but that ought to be fixed within council housing but we also need more community-led housing and we need more co-ops and some of those homes that the landlords currently own we've got a policy now for a right to co-op um, which would be just the best thing ever so rather than the right to buy if you have a home that's a house of multiple occupation you can get together create a co-op and buy that home from your landlord at the same kind of discount as right to buy what an amazing policy and you can do that sort of thing at a london level um if it's a voluntary basis and you're giving out the the discounts as grants but at the government level that right to co-op would be absolutely transformative um, and there's all sorts of other things you know community um, um, TMOs and, and all those kinds of things so I think a broad ecology of ways of organizing and controlling your homes would be absolutely fantastic um, and these things are not risk you know they're not problem free um, and I've spoken to barristers who when I say co-ops the housing barristers and I say co-ops they go oh, co-ops that's like half my workload they're always raving with each other but yes you do you have risks when it comes to community-led housing and things like cooperatives where people are genuinely at a very close level to the to where they are in control of what's going on you have the risks of cliques and you have the risks of um discrimination and bullying and all of those things but those are the problems i'd rather be solving than the problems of a massive market-led built-in system that where people fall through the gap gaps and end up on the streets that's the kind of problems I want to be solving as a housing campaigner in the future. So 
how do we how do we carry on now what are the things that we need to be doing we absolutely have to be winning the new rights of, of rent control and then working on the consequences of that and i think we need to be modeling the ways we want to organize housing in the future in the way we do our campaigning and work now so i don't think we just want campaigning organizations we need things like the london renters union where they're actually organizing to support each other in the now as well as campaigning for changes to policies in the future that's the empowered way to do this and i think we also ought to be doing more organizing to, to set up co-ops to to actually model and show how it works this alternative ecosystem and you know we'll if we start doing that we could if there's market downturns if things happen if things happen within the um the wider events of the world we could manage to do this on quite a large scale but we could also just be proving it on a small scale and um finally this is another big reason why i want to be the mayor of london because the mayor of london can stop piloting this stuff straight away. The Mayor of London has a huge housing budget that they can put much more into doing things in these different kinds of ways and just genuinely show the rest of the world how it's done. Wouldn't you want London to be that place everyone mentions when we talk about good housing policies, the way that everyone's talking about Paris now when it comes to doing uh, proper cycle lanes during the the lockdown um, you know I want to be the city that did housing right and I think as mayor of London that would be absolutely amazing um, so I want to hear from you now I want to hear um, what questions you have um, what questions you have about um, individual things we could ask for what you think about the, the suggestion I've made that we actually start just like you know, taking over and living in houses as, as things to, to demonstrate what's going on and different models of organising. I think we should we should absolutely be having that discussion now. And I hope I haven't talked for too long because I can talk when it comes to housing. I really, really can. I could do another hour and a half on this stuff. Um, but hopefully that was useful and a good frame for a good debate that we might have um, next. Thank you. Great. Well, thanks so much, Sean. Uh, so sort of have a little collective round of applause or uh, shake your hands for that. Um, so yeah, I think I could say for everyone, it's so genuinely refreshing to hear from you know a politician who is actually on the side of renters, you know, and wants to secure housing justice for everyone. So to hear that is, is a refreshing sound for all, I'm sure. Um, and why I for sure I'm hoping that Sean is elected London Mayor. Um, but you know, all we can do is hope and do our bit to ensure that happens. But um, what I'm going to do now, I'm not going to take up any more or oh, too much more space myself. I'm going to get some of these questions. We've got more questions flying in now, which is fantastic. So um, thank you so much for engaging. I'm just trying to, well, we've got some here. I'll look through those in a moment. I'm just going to lay one off for you now, Sean. Because um, it was just on the co-ops that I was just coming through. I had a few questions about that. Um, and there's one question is, could you just explain the, the right to sort of set up a co-op a little bit more, please? I can, and I have a press release I can dig up and link to, which I'll do once I finish explaining it. But essentially, it is um, something that Samir Giraj and Tom Chance developed, um, and I commissioned them to do some work from City Hall to see how feasible this this kind of right. We we, we wanted this. We, we had our our eye on this right, and we wanted to see how feasible it was, um, and how many people it could help. But essentially, it's it's the it's the right to buy for well you, we looked at right to buy for renters and that's obviously something you could have but then right to buy is such a sort of temporary gain and it does exacerbate inequalities in the end you know you end up somebody becomes a homeowner and then like eventually they become a landlord and, and that's not particularly what we want so we wanted to look at giving people the right to form a co-op and obviously if you all live in separate flats in different houses how you decide how to form the co-op is more difficult but in places in this building for example um this is this would qualify um we have a flat on every floor and there's four floors and there's a shop on the bottom um so there's four flats um and me and my neighbors would have the right to get together and and, and compare notes and say well hang on a minute we're all paying out I don't know what we all pay. We're probably paying out something like six thousand pounds a month in rent, right? So if we were, if instead of that we were to get a mortgage, could we buy this place off my landlord? And 
we, we looked, and this is what Tom and Samir modelled, basically most renters couldn't afford to just buy the house, like give, put in a decent offer to their landlord. But with a discount of 20%, which is around about the same as what you get if you do right to buy it. I've never done that, so I don't know exactly. But with a discount of 20% um, included, they most quite a lot of them could. And that right, therefore, to, to buy it off the landlord, as long as you're making a cooperative and you're running the, the building as a cooperative from then on, um, that that is a, is a right. Does that make sense? I might have explained it well enough. Um, but essentially, that sounded good. So we know it stays it stays affordable in perpetuity because that's what co-ops have as their constitution. I think as well, um, just to add, there's been um, a couple of questions about resources um, and whether we can send them. So I think if there's a press release on that as well, and we can do compile some resources to send around to attendees, we'll add that to that. So you can read some more information about, you know, all these things that we're talking about today after, after the call as well. Um, but also, just, there's so many questions coming in. I, I'm going to apologise now. I'm not going to get through even small number of these but really thank you for engaging so much it really is fantastic um, as we're sort of talking about different um, types of housing solutions to the, the housing crisis if um, there's a good question here that's come in which was if you were to build the UK housing system from scratch um, what do you sort of envision as the best balance of ownership in the sector sector so i.e how much proportion of social housing private ownerships cooperatives and, and, and let's difficult question potentially that's a really good question. What's but the it's a London plan? Is that... Yeah, what's the ideal? I mean, at the moment, yeah, London plan is a good, a good example of that because the London plan has defined the needs of Londoners. Um, and what that says is two thirds of the homes we need are low cost rent and low cost rent is essentially social, social rent levels. Um, so, yeah, that's I mean, if we're going to get to what we actually need for people, then um, we should be adding to the current stock. Two thirds of that should be social um, rent and uh, the other third, some of it, I think it's a bit of intermediate and then a really small proportion, like 10% is market. And if you compare that to what goes on with estate regenerations or any development, um, you get market, market is always more than, more than half. Um, and that's, that's crazy because every single market home you build is not fulfilling London's needs. It's a complete waste of, time effort space resources um even more resources the waste if you're knocking something down to build it um so yeah i think probably that is what we need to build but what we end where we actually end up i'm not i'm not sure because obviously as you start to fulfill needs need to change as well so Cool, thank you very much. Um, it's hard to choose the next questions, um, but there was one on a point that you made earlier about the overspend that, um, specifically in London, but the overspend that we've, we've given to renters, uh, given to landlords on top of inflation. Um, so it's an interesting question, which was, would that overspend, um, would that be enough to cover uh, universal basic income? Theoretically. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't quite understand that question because, um, it, it's it's not an income it's just it's, it's a historical added mm. up by year um but year by year now it's um it's it's more than a billion pounds a year is 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 the extra we're paying on top of what and this is just londoners so it's, mm. a, it's a lot um it also turn it into universal basic income that you'd have to bring it into the exchequer as a tax or something like that so yeah <laughs> cool <laughs> um Universal, I mean, universal basic income also um, has a cost, which is obviously, you know, different net than it is gross as well. So, yeah, who knows? Cool. But Thank you. It's in my head. <laughs> um, so, moving on to how we sort of organise and, and, and fight back um, to, to sort of claim housing justice. Um, so, how do we use the clarity around the issue of homelessness, which has been demonstrated in this crisis, to empower people to support this movement going forward? Um, I mean, one thing we have now, which has been something that, that I pushed for the, the second this was about to happen, um, is we have a lot of, of home people who are formerly street homeless now living in hotels. Because you abs this is the thing, you, uh, suddenly there's a crisis and everyone, oh yeah, actually we can't have people on the streets. Yeah, we never could. We, could, we never could allow people to live on the streets. But particularly now, they've recognised that there is a, an obligation to house people in ways that are, are safe and, and uh, humane. So those people who are now living in hotels, we're being, they're being paid for by, um, by the GLA. Some of it's coming out of council budgets. It's all quite complicated, actually, at a London level. Um, and we need more funding from the government for that. But there's the question of 
well then what do we do because again you can't you can't give someone a right and then take it you can't you can't take that away from people those people now need to be found new homes um and and one thing i've said i mean who knows what's going to happen with the economy because obviously there's lots of stuff going on that's um that's quite complicated and, and difficult for the economy but there are an awful lot of new market homes that have been built in london that people have not yet moved into and this is something i wrote to tom copley who's the deputy mayor for housing about a couple of weeks ago and i got an answer back today um so breaking news um yes they are looking at bringing those homes into use um in the near future possibly very temporarily for some more of the people who are becoming homeless because people are still becoming homeless you can see if there's that if there's 110,000 people who are sofa surfing and your sofa surfing host gets ill you can see why people might need to move out of those homes even um so more people are going to be in housing need so it might be for that but i wouldn't be surprised if we didn't try and find some way of getting those homes into our council system because the people who bought them might not be able to find the, the airbnb customers that they were hoping for or whatever so i think there's a there's a genuine chance to start repurposing some of the homes that already exist in london and the other type of home that we're trying to keep going uh, for this use is the ones that are on estates that are um slated for demolition but haven't yet been de demolished so they're still good homes um a lot of them have property guardians in and i've been campaigning not to have property guardians thrown out but also the ones that are just sitting there those are being looked at to be used for temporary accommodation and i think they could be used more permanently as well um you know it's always been the case that there's been enough bedrooms in london for all the people that we have it's just that they're not distributed correctly um, and a lot of homes are, are, are owned and not lived in and i think there is there's is a lot we can do to to get those those owned but empty homes into some sort of temporary accommodation have council system possibly own them in the end as council or GLA assets it's there's yeah we'll have to see what happens next but there's there's definitely homes there that we we could have our eye on and it'd save having to build council homes if we could just acquire them certain um Sean, that's a really interesting answer because it's just come on to another question that um, is quite related which is we talked about different solutions there to solving um the, the housing need and the housing shortage and um the question here is about often the solution to the housing shortage is sort of building more houses um, which can potentially have a high ecological footprint so is there other ways we can sort of reconcile housing need um sort of with the ecological crisis yeah 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 absolutely because i mean obviously not, i mean one one way of getting more homes is not to demolish the ones we already have um if you look at the um the losses of council homes in in recent years there's a big chunk going from right to buy but also i mean i've, I've added up the numbers and found um oh now i have to remember my numbers i think there are seven thousand homes that have been demolished and not replaced the net loss of homes through through estate re, um, regeneration um over like a 10-year period and that is that's a lot of homes that you just we would have had and we wouldn't need to build um and there's and there's also um ways of creating new homes out of old buildings as well um i, I work a lot on me and caroline russell both um are a bit obsessed with embodied carbon because it is the the missing thing in um uh, carbon policy because all the stuff does actually use up carbon in being produced and i really worry that we could because you have to work in carbon budgets not just in annual emissions and i really worry that we could use our entire carbon budget for housing building eco homes from scratch instead of converting them from from concrete buildings that already exist and i think there's there's definite scope to convert other buildings like you know multi-story car parks and if you go back to the concrete core and build out from that it's, yeah, there's a there's huge scope to be doing that um and the other places i want to look at that are not green belt are small sites so car parks primarily <laughs> can you see there's a bit of a theme emerging here like, <laughs> uh, one, one thing i've proposed is a, um, a people's land commission to go and hunt for sites that um we would like to be built on in a local area once you've got local consent and you're asking local people to be in control of planning for those sites you don't have the kinds of problems that you get with a lot of planning applications people know that they're getting something that the local community wants and needs and there's real there's huge scope for doing that the mayor kind of in the local in the london plan recently had sort of big plans and put big targets in for small sites and then backed it up with like no action he didn't do any of this community um land commission type stuff that i wanted to do so the actual inspector threw out the targets made them be reduced because the mayor 
hadn't made them realistic, but they are realistic. We can we can do this to a very large extent. Great, thanks. Um, I'm going to squeeze out another couple of questions at you, Sharon, because everyone's just so engaged here that I just feel I try and get one or two more of these questions out. Um, <laughs> so this one here is quite interesting. Um, do, do you think young people should be aiming to buy property primarily as their main goal, or um, perhaps more like in Europe, where be okay with the prospect of renting? And is that more tied to what the appeal of renting is and what security we have as renters? Yes, exactly. I mean, we've all been, I mean, it's been government policy for forever to, um, oh, oh, it's doing battery, battery save. Sorry, been here for too long. Um, yeah, no, the government, the policy has made, it's made us, it's to make us want to own property. And that's the whole, that's the big, the big right to buy betrayal that a lot of the um the leaseholders now find it's 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 wrong people people need and want secure homes um and that is that is the thing we should be aiming to provide to people and the best security is a is a an open-ended tenancy that's that's secure i kind of give one example which is um i know leaseholders for example who then um they become council leaseholders and they've you know they've proud of themselves for owning the home but proud also to be the council's leaseholder um so sort of somewhere in between um and then they've got older and they've needed to move to a more accessible place and they've asked the council can we swap our lease to another council flat that's more accessible and the council's just been like no nope, you're on your own you're a leaseholder can't help you whereas if you were a tenant you'd be able to exchange your home for one that was more accessible so they like literally lost the right to live in an accessible home by buying their home it's just you know it's a it's a false goal in lots of ways and i i will stay renting i'm sure forever but i would more than more than anything want to be in part of a co-op yeah, I think it's a sad reality for how long um, most of us are probably going to be renting our homes from, from private landlords, but not unless <laughs> our fight for change is successful, which, which it will be. Um, so I think I'm just going to give it a quick moment, I think, for a charger to come through. I can hear you still. Oh, fantastic. Um, so I'm just, I'm going to choose this one because uh, selfishly, I faced this conundrum and I would very much like to hear your answer as well. So it's useful. Um, so what would be sort of your message into the more small time landlords who maybe own the one property who say they rely on that rental income? They're not sort of, you know, big, big, big landlords, um, whilst also still fighting for, for rent forgiveness for renters who can't pay, you know, free, free, free months of rent. So, yeah. So I think my, the implication from what I answered earlier on um, was that in, in landlords in those cases ought to be able to claim back some support from the government if they genuinely rely on that income. Um, but I don't think it's a good model to have lots of people who individually are trying to be what is a profession um, in their spare time for no hassle. This is the problem that we we have found um, with with some landlords who, you know, a lot of them are just not very good at it and they're not you know mendacious or, or malicious about being useless at servicing their, their tenants and not being able to get things fixed they, they're just not up to the job and it is a job and they ought to and people ought to recognize that so um i think a lot of people who've become landlords in that way and maybe only have one property ought to really think about whether that's what they want to do and whether they can take handle the responsibility um, because it is important people's right to a decent home is is more important than their right to an easy quiet profit great thank you very much um and we are at nine o'clock so i'm aware that um shouldn't really keep you i've seen one nice question come through so um we've had a question which is just uh, asking uh did you did you go to uni and, and what course did you did you study which i think is quite a nice question to end on <laughs> I, I did go to university um and i went to um i went to oxford university and i studied one of their best courses which is metallurgy and the science of materials and this is a weld that i did <laughs> it's an experimental weld and it's gone a bit rusty i don't know if you can even see the weld there's like a triangular bit in the middle so i I, I didn't necessarily do this but I did they let me hold the arc weld for a little while while we were making the experimental weld and then I did testing on these blocks that we cut from the big weld to see if they were any good I worked I worked for British Steel for a whole summer doing this kind of thing but yeah so I know about I know about metallurgy and I know about plastics and um like cement and um 
superconductors. And I don't know about graphene because they hadn't invented graphene when I was in the class. It's a really good thing to study because it's fast moving, you see. They invented a whole new material. I studied it. Oh, amazing. I'm so glad that question was asked now. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, well, <laughs> um, I think that's a, a lovely place to end it. I'm sorry if you can hear shouting. There's a, there's a madness going off outside my window right now. Um, but oh, what's that there? That's a, that's a sample of another thing that I was experimenting on that went in a, um, uh, for a microscope. Amazing. <laughs> awesome. Um, well, <laughs> Uh, bro, well, I'm going to leave it there because I could probably keep you for the rest of the night with questions and uh, like like me you could probably talk about housing for the rest of the night but we always have to call it quits somewhere um, so just to everyone who's attended today uh, thank you so much uh, everyone who's a young green who's a green who's not a young green or a green at all um, please continue to come to our talks um, and I think I'm going to pass back to Katrina for a quick message again and then um, we'll be we'll be out Yes, you are indeed. Thank you very much. And yeah, I would just echo massive thanks to Sean and to Tyrone for sifting through all those questions and, and thanks to everyone who engaged and sent them in. That's amazing. Um, I'm now going to give you four links in the chat. So, oh, you've all frozen. Have I frozen? No, we're okay. Um, if my lovely coast could freeze the chat for everyone except us, that would be great. So we can all see the links. Uh, cool. So, as I said before, uh, we've got a whole series of these events coming up um, over the next few weeks. Uh, on Monday, uh, we've got Asad Raymond from War on One, who's going to be talking to us about capitalism, colonialism and how they drive climate change. And you lucky, lucky people can sign up for that right now. Uh, so I'm going to pop the link to that in the chat for number one. Oh, where's my chat? There it is. Fabulous. Um, and we've got lots more events coming up. Uh, as I said, we've got a couple earlier. Hey, maybe we'll even have one from Sean about material science. Who knows? Um, and I also got a couple of exciting... No, okay, she says no, we won't do that. But we do have some more on-message ones uh, coming up. Uh, and I'm going to post a link to that next so you can see what else we've got coming up over the next few weeks. As I mentioned, we've got strikes. Um, we've got people start taking back public own ownership. Um, of public services um, and I also got a couple of emails today actually to set up ones following on from that so do keep an eye on that website because there's, there's going to be more stuff on there very soon um, and again just to echo that if you are in a position to give us two pounds a month if you've got an income at the moment I know not everybody does so this is completely you know if you are in a position to do so and um, to help us kind of keep running these events and actually to help us kind of plan for the future beyond the next couple of months that's really really helpful that link is going in the chat too again. So this one, when you pop it in the browser, it will, oh, sorry, Tom's just told me I've been sending them all to him instead of everyone. I'll send them all to everyone now. Um, yes, if it's not working, Tom, you're just gonna have to do it. Uh, <laughs> sorry about that. There's always, you can't have a webinar without a technical hitch. It's not possible. <laughs> um, but yeah, this link, when you paste it in your uh, browser, it will automatically put it onto two pounds a month, but you can adjust that if you wish. And I have one last ask for you, one last link for you. If you've been on one of our calls already, you'll know this is a bit where we put words in your mouth, as Rosie likes to say. Um, so if you have Twitter, the link that we're about to put in now, it automatically pre-fills a tweet for you to post on your Twitter about what a great time you've had and about all the exciting things that I learned from Sean today. Um, if you do have other social if you do have other social medias, please do post on there as well. We want to spread the word, you know, the best way that we get out the kind of the message about all these events is through word of mouth. So please, please do that. Um, and the one I have just posted will automatically uh, put that on your Twitter for you, though you can edit it. And so that is me. We will leave the conversation open for a bit because I know we've just posted a whole loads of things uh, in there. So we'll leave the conversation open a bit when we stop talking so you can um, copy and paste them into your browser. Um, but again, just a really big thank you. Thank you to everyone for dialing in. Thank you for asking questions. Um, and Sean's waving at me. Do you want to say something before we go? No, I was doing thank you. Oh, you are doing thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I think my timing's a bit off. Um, yes, thank you. I'm also going to do a wave then. So thank you so, so much for dialing in. It was really great Thanks to guys see you. guys all great work. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, and thanks, Sean. <laughs> Bye, see you soon. Thanks, Katrina, for making me laugh. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> thanks. See you next time, Monday.
Yeah.